Um, today we're we're planning on doing a 30-minute webinar. Um, so just by uh, just by way of some um, some housekeeping before we actually get started properly, um, we're going to cover off uh, some agile testing skills that hopefully uh, are going to help you guys to um, deliver leaner, meaner, agile testing. Um, so we're going to talk a, a little bit about what agile testing actually is um, and then we're going to cover off some everyday practices that any tester, whether they're working on an agile team or not, can implement to make their testing um, lean. Um, and then we're going to talk about some uh, some additional skills that testers can uh, can start working on um, to keep pace with uh, with development activities uh, when they are working on agile teams in kind of technical environments. Um, so as I mentioned, um, we're hoping the uh, the webinar is going to be around 30 minutes long. Um, there will be an opportunity for questions at the end, so if you do have questions as we're going along, please do feel free to send those to us via the chat screen, um, and we will pick some of those up um, and hopefully provide you with some uh, some answers once we've uh, once we've covered off the the material in the webinar. Um, if for um, whatever reason. Um, some of your colleagues uh, weren't able to make the webinar today. We are recording it um, and we will be sending out the um, recorded webinar at a later date. Um, so don't worry about that. Equally, um, folk who weren't able to, uh, to attend it at all for whatever reason um, will get sent a, a link to the webinar as well. Um, and I think that's, uh, that's pretty much it in terms of uh, housekeeping. Um, so just by, uh, by way of some introductions, my name's Simon, um, I am the TestRail product manager um, as of uh, approximately a couple of months ago. Um, prior to that, I was working as um, a hands-on software tester, um, sometimes a test manager, sometimes um, a, a technical tester, um, working on automation um, and other forms of, uh, sort of fairly technical testing. Um, and I've also done a, a fair bit of um, writing and speaking uh, about software testing in the past, um, most notably, I guess, working um, fairly closely with the, the Ministry of Testing, um, helping them to organize and MC the, uh, the first few test bash conferences, um, as well as getting them started with uh, some of the, the material for their dojo um, testing training site. Um, if you want to follow me, you can do so on um, at SJP Knight on Twitter, or you can take a look at my LinkedIn profile. Um, and also with us today, we have um, our special guest, Jess Ingrassolino. Hi, Simon. Thanks so much, and uh, thank you for having me. So currently, I am a senior member of the technical staff at Salesforce.org, and I'm on the QA team. Prior to being at Salesforce.org, I worked at Bitly and Rent the Runway and Nomi, and I helped to build out their test automation systems from the ground up. And I also worked with the teams to develop and implement testing practices throughout. So any kind of exploratory testing, any kind of uh, load testing, IoT testing, so different things like that, which was really some fun experiences that you can get from working in a smaller startup. Uh, I tweet at Jess underscore Ingrass, and um, I love Twitter. I learn a lot from it, so I love interacting with everybody on Twitter. So that's a great way to reach out with a DM if you have a specific question that you don't have time for me to answer uh, on today's webinar. So Jess, let me just say up front, it is a real pleasure um, to have you on the webinar today um, and we're really grateful to um, have you doing this with us. Jess has written um, a number of articles for us on the TestRail blog um, and the, uh, the, the material that we're going to cover in the webinar today is largely um, based on that, that material. Um, so I just want to encourage you all up front, if you, if you haven't already read um, Jess's, uh, Jess's work for us on the, the blog, please do um, go and check it out. So 
before we uh, before we dive into the uh, the material proper, um, it it the, the, it begs the question, you know, what what is agile testing? When we when we talk about agile testing, um, what do we uh, what do we actually mean by that? Um, and I guess quite often um, we see images like the uh, the one on this slide. Chris, if you can push the button. That's great. So probably when um, when you read about um, agile testing on the uh, the interweb, you'll see images like this one of you know a, a group of uh, group of guys standing around I guess what what is intended to, to be a Kanban board there um, with a bunch of post-it notes on it um, and it, it all looks kind of idyllic um, and I don't know how many of the, the people on the call are actually working on agile projects directly um, but certainly my experience has uh, on occasion been somewhat more like the uh, the next picture Chris where you know things aren't quite so idyllic, and in actual fact, you're you're working with a, a team um, upon whom agile practices are are being imposed rather than um, you know being discovered um, by themselves and and implemented in a in a way that you know facilitates um, uh, an enjoyable and um, I guess you know. Um, that, that embodies some of the uh, the agile principles. Um, so, f I mean, for myself, when I when I think about um, agile testing, and when I I've known in the the past that I've been um, testing effectively in an agile context, one of the the key indicators for me has been that I've been able to to deliver testing more or less at the the same time as features are, are actually being delivered. So that is to say that my testing is being carried out in in parallel with the uh, the development work, and it's kind of underpinning the, the the developers' activities and helping them to deliver better quality code um, faster. And I, Jess, what what are your thoughts? What are, what is agile testing? If you were to to try and summarize it in some way, Simon, that's a great question, and I really think that there's sort of capital. A agile, where we talk about sort of in quotes best practices and the things that are kind of the ideal, right? But then there's a kind of lowercase agile, and I think that in many situations, especially for those of us who are not working in agile teams or who are working in agile teams that are still finding their way, that the lowercase agile and the things that we can do every day as testers to do as you say, make our testing align as closely as possible with development, that to me is the best testing that I've ever delivered in my opinion and in the feedback I've received is that testing that has gone alongside with the developers, helping to support them, giving them fast feedback and contributing value to the product as uh, quickly as possible and also that iteration happening because of the testing that I'm delivering. So I tend to focus more of my discussions and articles on my experience as a, what I would call maybe a lowercase a agile tester, um, because I know that all of our environments are very different. Yeah, that's uh, that's so true. So, I mean, I think it's fair to say that um, most of the, the people on this call probably have um, some experience of uh, of working in an agile context, you know, they're they're likely to to be working on um, an agile team to some degree or another, even if that's just a, a team that's trying to to be more small a agile and and lean in their development and delivery um, approaches. So to that end, Jess, you've um, You've written um, for us about um, practices that, that every tester, whether or not they are working on a um, quote unquote agile team, can uh, can implement and start to practice to, to um, make themselves and their testing more effective. So, should we uh, should we dig into those? Yeah, let's do. We're so going to start off with um, working software, minimizing necessary documentation. So that's on the, the next slide, I think, Chris. So minimizing documentation, 
I think the obvious reason to do it is that the more documents that there are in more separated and disparate forms, the less likely anybody is to refer to the documentation or to find the documentation that they need. So in testing, some something that I've used that's been really helpful is to use session-based testing and test charters. Now, I tend to use these really collaboratively with my development team, and I'll get back to that in a minute. Uh, why these test charters are really important to my team is because we can document ideas, we can document plans, we can share links to other documents, images, screenshots, bugs, and it all exists within the same document. Now, um, at salesforce.org, we happen to use a tool called Quip, which allows us to put all of this together, but any other kind of collaborative documentation tool, uh, Google Docs, for example, would work in allowing multiple people to contribute. So the way that we do this is that either I or a developer, and right now we have several developers who actually use test charters to help them think about organizing their work. So it's it's been really neat to see the evolution of the test charter at .org. So either I or the developer will start the creation of a test charter and start thinking about what are we worried about? What are areas of risk? What do we need to test? What does this touch? Then we have our discussions inside of the Quip doc. We're all remote, so we don't have always the option of running over to somebody and saying, oh, hey, do you mind taking a look at this? We have to collaborate within our documentations and our chats. So we have that comment section in our documentation, and that allows us to collaborate, ask questions, answer concerns. Another thing is that we use the tagging feature within our document so we can make sure that we're drawing in community managers, product managers, and any other stakeholders to actually look at the document and look at what we're thinking about testing. So we're really drawing on a body of community knowledge. And then the key thing in kind of having that participation is that we're all in the testing process. So again, those feedback points, those data points, the images, the links, the concerns are all going into that doc. So when the testing is done, it's not just uh, one person saying it's done. Everybody has participated and that document has now a body of knowledge from all of the stakeholders that can be referenced in the future should a bug come up against that certain uh, feature or should somebody just be coming into the team and need some information because they're new to the team. Um, the final thing I think a lot of people have asked me, well, how do you get developers to participate in that? Because, and that's you know something where I think I've had the most success in inviting people to engage rather than requiring them to engage. And even though it's a small distinction, it makes a big difference because if, even if one person starts to use something successfully, then that one person will tend to share that information with the rest of their team. And so your buy-in might be a little slower, but you have the advantage of it being perhaps uh, with less disagreement. Yeah. That's a, that's a great point, Jess. I think um, I actually asked you that question um, myself as well, didn't I, while, while we were preparing for this webinar. How do you get developers to, to buy into that process? Because, um, and again, I, don't, I can't speak for everybody, but my experience of working with, uh, with developers has been that they don't, they're not always so great at, at documenting their work. Yeah, I think that it can be the invitation is part of it, and also it's hard. How do you know what to document? How do you know what is helpful for somebody else? And using the test charter has uh, really helped the developers to articulate to me, this is what is useful when I am going to test. Yeah. So I maybe you know perhaps it's not an issue of doesn't want to so much as an issue of I don't know what you need. Yep, yeah, so true, uh, and very helpful. Um, so next up, we've got um, customer collaboration and good test design. 
Absolutely. So, you know, I think that collaborating with customers for any of us, I mean, we're delivering a software product and we want somebody to use that product. So finding all of the possible ways that we can to get different perspectives on our product is, of course, very helpful. Now, the question becomes, how do we have time to do that? We're testers. We have usually far more work to test than we can actually get done. And so there are a lot of decisions that need to be made about uh, the strategies that we use to get information. So understanding our customer view by working with customer services and customer support has been a really critical way for me to learn about what the customer cares about. Now, sometimes that doesn't always go in parallel with what uh, the business needs might be. I mean, the end goal, yes, is absolutely making sure the customer has a satisfactory experience. And there may be other things that need to happen in order for the customer to have that experience that the customer themselves is not aware of. So while it's not the whole picture of the business, understanding what the customer cares about can really help to focus on potential areas of risk. And working with customer services and support is a great way to find out what our customers complaining about the most, what is happening, and how can we get inside of their head a little bit. At uh, Rent the Runway, for example, something that we all did, our entire company assisted on calls and support tickets, especially during the holiday season, because there was a massive amount, as Rent the Runway is a couture dress and evening wear rental service. As you can imagine, in major uh, urban areas in the United States, this is a very uh, popular service. It, during the holiday time. So our customer service needs would quadruple and there's no way to scale up just for a month of the year. So everybody hopped on and took a two hour shift. And what we really learned was not only what do our customers care about, but how are they engaging with our product? How are they clicking a button? What is frustrating them very specifically? And I will say that us providing that assistance gave me more information about how the customer interacted with the product and what they cared about than any amount of kind of guesswork or brainstorming or thinking because they were just telling me this is what I need. This is what is not working. So good test design comes from information. And if we can gather information and do that in a way that also helps the business, then that's even better. So. If you can't get on the phone with, um, you know, in a customer service capacity, definitely reach out to your customer service team, your support team, read reviews of your product on any kind of review sites or the app store, and figure out what makes your customers tick, because that will help you design tests that really address the issues that your customers are caring about. Yeah. Some of the uh, some of the most illuminating experiences I've had as a as a tester is uh, is when I've gotten directly involved in supporting customer issues on on their um, on their servers or on on sort of in a, a production kind of situation where you're getting to to see how they actually use the the product as you said Jess um, it's a it's a great learning experience if you're you're able to to do that. Absolutely. So we've got uh, virtuous feedback loops next. Yeah, so I mean, isn't part of the Agile discussion, whether you're doing big A Agile or whether you're just starting to investigate Agile practices, how can we get the feedback and the information we need to iterate on our product? So what I've noticed in working in smaller companies and larger companies is that good feedback involves every person who needs the information. And it's really, it happens in real time. So if there's a feature that's being developed, if I am doing testing on that and I find something that just seems off, maybe it isn't a, doesn't read to me as a bug, but it reads to me as something that I have a question about, I don't wait to ask that question. Again, I use the test charter and I tag a developer and say, hey, here's a screenshot or here's a video, a screen capture video of what I saw. Here's an error log. 
what what do you think this is? Is this something I should investigate, or is it something that I can leave alone? Why might it be happening? It takes me maybe, you know, my testing time plus two minutes to throw that into the document, and as a remote team, I get a response pretty quickly uh, on my concerns, and then I can move forward based on that feedback and say, okay, I should spend more time because this reads weird and we don't know why, or I shouldn't spend any more time here because even though this reads weird, here's a history behind it that I just got from the developer. So their feedback helps me to adjust my testing. My feedback helps them to see potential issues and or to see how something might read funny, even if it isn't a bug, like, hmm, maybe we should consider that as a design uh, adjustment in the future. So sometimes the thing that I've heard from people that they're concerned with is how do we get the feedback we need? I've asked a developer a question or I've asked a product manager a question several times and I haven't received their feedback. So that's a fair question. Everybody's busy. And as testers, we operate among multiple areas of influence and multiple teams. We're really very cross team people and sometimes we're cross product people too. So getting creative about getting feedback means figuring out how to engage with each team. Maybe that means for you using a lot of different devices. Um, so let's say you have a mobile team, you have a web team, maybe you have a desktop application team. Um, get feedback from each of those teams about their concerns for risk. If you're working on a product with them, make sure that you get to talk to their customer service representatives from each team so you're getting feedback from that's specific to the product or to the customer. Using different platforms to get feedback. Taking a look at uh, App Store ratings, App Store reviews. Are there any patterns that you see over time in reviews for your product that either indicate customer concerns or that you might address? You can take a look at analytics. So any analytics platform can give you information about how long it's taking for your users to access your page, how long they're staying on a page, what are your bounce rates for a certain page, are there, is there click through? These are all pieces of feedback and you don't need to wait for them. You can just get them yourself as a researching tester. Getting different roles involved so you have a lot of different perspectives. Again, it comes back to what does your customer think? What does the product think? What do your internal users of your product think? What do they need? And getting people using different skills that they may have. So you have a lot of different approaches to getting feedback. So if you have somebody on your team who is excellent at reaching out to customers, sending emails, maybe they have a specific contact or they're able to set up a beta for your product so that way that you can get that customer external feedback in a way that's very low risk to your business. Those are all great ways to keep your feedback rich, to keep it quick, and to keep it involving every stakeholder in your product. Great, thanks Jess. So I guess one of the, the things that testers um, on agile teams often uh, often struggle with is um, how to how to keep pace with the uh, the developers at a kind of technical level. So you've provided us with some um, some excellent sort of high level strategies that any tester can uh, can implement to um, to make themselves leaner and, and more agile on a, a day to day basis. Um, but now we're going to go into some specific skills that testers can um, pick up that aren't coding focused, that aren't necessarily related um, to writing and implementing test automation, um, but that can really help them out in their day-to-day -day testing activities. So we're gonna start off by looking at version control. Absolutely, so this is one of the first skills that I learned as a tester when I was starting out just doing planning, all the testing for a product, but not doing any automation whatsoever. Learning version control really helped me by allowing me to collaborate with developers as they were doing their work. So you can 
figure out what your company is using, SVN, Git, they may be using something like Bitbucket, it, whatever source control platform that, or version control platform your company is using, learning how to use it means that your developers can see you as a resource because you can work more closely with them. For example, um, at one company, I would, the developers would finish a piece of a part of their story, and our stories were really well scoped at this company in the capital A Agile sense, yet a I had a developer who, whenever he made a change to anything that touched financial or uh, payment processing, he liked me to take a look. I would pull his latest branch, I would deploy the app with his branch in it, and I would actually do all of that testing. So I was able to provide him helpful feedback as I went along as he was developing that product. Um, and again, this is great even if you never intend to write a line of code in your life. If you can get into the command line, you can learn to use Git, or if you want to use a Git desktop tool, there are some of those available. SVN management can be done through command line. So if you are doing any of this, even if you never want to write a line of code, you can still become more lean, more agile, and provide more value throughout the development life cycle by using version control. Yeah, and there are, there are lots of different tools that, that you can use um, to interact with um, your team's uh, source code repository these days, right? I mean, you mentioned Bitbucket. Um, with Bitbucket, you can just go, go online um, and look and, and see what your developers have committed, um, what code they actually changed, what, if any, comments um, they added to that, that commit. Um, and there are other tools that you can use as well just to, just to see what's being checked in, how often, and, and what's being changed. So, yeah, there's, uh, there's lots of different ways that, that you can approach um, version control. And the other thing I might recommend is through any of those tools that have a web interface where users can be added, ask to be a reviewer or even to be tagged on items where you've provided yeah. testing. And then you can start to have an understanding of the developer conversations around it, yeah. of the code base. So again, even if you never intend to write automation, you're still having that understanding of what they are talking about. And it does seep in over time and you do start to learn uh, about the nuances of their conversations and what matters to them. Yeah, and um, closely related, I guess, is uh, taking a look at the log files, right? Yeah, definitely. I mean, you know, there are types, I mean, it, upon first thinking about it, some testers might think, why would I do that? Or what is the value proposition? First of all, if you do have any kind of automated testing, even if you are not writing any of that, you can still look at logs on the tests themselves and make sure that your tests are failing because they're failing, not because of concurrency issues or timeout issues or something like that. Secondly, you have system or security logs that can be made available to you by the DevOps team, and we can talk more about that later uh, when we talk about the different ways DevOps can help. You can check log files while your app is running and while you're doing testing. So often I would have a tail F running on my log while I would be testing a feature branch from a developer in case something happened. Then I could give them the output from the log in addition to telling them this is what I did. Also, I actually was part of a issue where a we caught something during deployment because we had a log failure and one there was a development issue where we had accidentally deployed some incorrect database merges and because we caught it very early on in the process we were able to revert back our changes and instead of deploying it to our six servers we started to deploy to one server and said, oh, this is this is bad. So we caught that all through logs. And had we not been viewing logs and had we waited until production and viewing it through the UI, 
we would have completely uh, destroyed a lot of people's data. So, you know, it, there's real world implications for using log files. And the other kinds of logs are, of course, console logs, which we'll talk about more um, in just a minute. So that's in the, uh, the the browser console, right? Yeah, indeed, yes. So the browser developer console is one of the best tools available because it doesn't require any special installation. There are tons of materials to dig deep and learn about every single function of the browser tools in every major browser that we would be using to test and deliver software for our clients. So I think a lot of people use browser tools for uh, inspecting elements or doing things for test automation, or maybe they have heard of that the most often. But the other things that the browser console can, so can offer are viewing info from API requests, using them for mobile testing, when we don't have a lot of devices or when the cost of a device lab is not reasonable. We can also use them to generate JavaScript code to interact with our web apps, and that can be used for load testing, security testing, and again, there's tons of information about how to do this. You need to know that you can do it, and once you know that that's something you can do, now you can go and research how you can use the browser console to interact effectively with your apps. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I love this stuff that you're talking about right now, Jess, because I see the, see the, the, the developer console and the, the log files, um, and I know you're going to talk about some of the, uh, the DevOps tools um, in a, a few moments as well, but I, I see all of these tools as, um, as being basically an extension of myself as a, as a tester. They're kind of augmenting my capabilities. They're giving me insights into the application um, that I might not otherwise have if I'm simply carrying out um, some black box testing via the, the UI or the API. If I'm scrutinizing the, the logs, if I'm tail-effing them as I'm passing requests into an API, for example, then that, that, that just gives me um, another indication as to, to what the application is doing in addition to the, the responses that I get from, for example, the, the API. Um, so it's, uh, it's really worth um, trying to uh, trying to develop those skills wherever you can. I completely agree, and you know that makes me think of the value that we provide when we can give developers this these information pieces that are more technical. So it's our observation plus a log to show them where to look for the problem, or you know another piece of information that they can use to act more quickly. Yeah. So you're going to talk about um, accessibility testing tools as well, right? That seems um, seems a little different to uh, to some of the other stuff that we've talked about here. Yeah, and it and it is in the sense that it's a different direction of testing. The reason that I think it's really important to consider is because, first of all, we have customers that have a multiple needs of to access our products, and secondly not only do we have those customers from a business perspective, but we have those customers and are required to provide things from a legal perspective. And when you're thinking about a product going to market, you need to think about all of the requirements for that product to go to market. Um, and certain products must be accessible in certain ways. And so, you know, we can help as testers by actually thinking of sometimes the simplest things. So first of all, unplug your tech. Sometimes a testing tool is really ourselves. Unplug your mouse, unplug your trackpad, turn off the images on your site. Can you navigate? Do you, is it easy to do? Is it difficult to do? If you know your site and you don't understand it without images, if you know your site but you can't get around it, how is a person who's never seen your site supposed to interact with that site and have a good experience. This is information. Do you have captions or transcripts for images and video? If you shut off your images on your site and all you see is image 123456.png, that you're realizing that that's the information perhaps coming across to somebody who is using a screen reader 
And that gives them no information about what's on the page, it gives them nothing to interact with. So there are some technical tools that can help with starting to understand how users uh, who are maybe atypical or have uh, different accessibility requirements are actually using your product. So first of all, you have screen reader software. So a great way to use this is to turn on your screen reader software and Macs have this built in in the form of voiceover. Turn it on and cover the window of your laptop screen. Blindfold yourself. Do you understand the site that your developers have built and that you have tested when it's being read to you? If not, there's a problem. If you're looking for other kinds of accessibility tools, you can use Wave free browser plugins and that will go through your DOM and it will identify areas that have issues after CSS or JavaScript have been applied to the page. So these kinds of modifications to your site improve accessibility for everybody so that gives you a broader audience and make sure that you are meeting the needs of all your users both through the legal stance and through giving your users the best possible experience which is what you want and becoming familiar with these tools sooner or later is not going to be a choice it's going to be a requirement so get familiar now get in the mindset now and having multiple people who can help you will really push the team forward when these changes become non-optional. Yeah. So often I think um, accessibility testing is, is kind of a, an afterthought um, when the really the, the sooner we can get that kind of testing done and, and provide um, feedback to the designers, to the developers, um, the better it's going to be for, for the whole project. Yeah, agreed, for sure. Okay, we're on to um, virtual machines. So really quickly, a lot of us are using some form of virtualization, even if we don't realize it. Specific to testing, we can use individualized VMs for browser-specific testing. Uh, Microsoft provides different VMs for older versions of IE, which can really help if you're testing using a Mac or a Linux machine. Um, you can use different forms of virtualization in terms of containers. So application testing, creating and destroying test environments at will is oftentimes done through containerization and your DevOps team can really help out a lot with that or your release engineering team, whatever, whoever's in charge of uh, those things. And I think that that really ties into knowing what to ask for as a tester. So if you're not sure, you know, if you'd like to have, say, a destructive testing environment or be able to create and destroy a whole environment at will for whatever reasons you need, there are things that you can ask your DevOps team to help with. Yep, absolutely. And uh, on the subject of DevOps? So the DevOps team has been probably my greatest resource in my journey as a tester. So they have provided me with so much information and I think that all they really require is for you to ask them. Um, so I've gone to different members of the DevOps team just wanting to know uh, information to help me determine areas of risk. So asking them, you know, what is the uh, speed of requests, what is the speed of page loads, what is the uh, amount of page access levels, what parts of the product are our customers using all the time, and does that match with what we're testing and what we think they're using all the time. Also, they, you know, DevOps has monitoring and logging constantly, so you can ask them to walk you through the logging tools. They're typically happy to do it. And depending on the tools you're using, they might be open source, which means your DevOps team can give you access. If it's a license situation, they may not be able to give you access depending on well, the licensing agreement your company has if you're using a third party vendor, but they can still walk you through what kind of information they get, how it works, what they're looking for. 
and if you can get access then you can also become an agent for observation and you can use any kind of integrations that they have with their multiple uh, log files into a tool say um, Splunk or another kind of uh, visualization tool where you can start to get information and invest investigate problems as a tester and surface those problems again in a way that is a little bit more technical and provides more immediate value to the developers because it's also linking back to uh, exactly where something is happening. Another thing is that developers are always on call and you know specifically there might be a developer and a DevOps person who take an on-call rotation. You can ask to be a part of that. They aren't going to say no. Not that you want to necessarily put yourself into that situation all the time, but it does help you gain an understanding of that side of the development operation. It helps you to understand concerns that are related to things that sometimes see more in the weeds. And participating in those discussions helps you learn about the product. Also, you can learn about servers, different test environments, how are they created, how are they managed, how is data moved in and out of them, and technical release processes. Are there improvements that can be made? Are there things that you would like to see and improved? Are there historical reasons for doing things and maybe you don't know what they are? Talking with DevOps, asking these questions, doing this research can really help to expand your knowledge of the product and give you the information that you need to ask different questions, to ask better questions, and to mitigate a lot of risk. Yeah, that's uh, great advice, Jess. And it's um, it's worth noting that the peop all of the people um, on the, the teams, the folk on the, the call are probably working with, most likely have many of these skills. And you can just go up to them and have a conversation about what the, the best way is to, to get started with some of the, the tools um, and the um, and the, the skills that, that Jess has been talking about. Um, don't ever, people shouldn't ever be um, afraid to, to go and have those, those conversations um, and to try and pick up those, those skills from the, the developers and the, the DevOps guys um, on, on the teams that you're working with. Um, just be, uh, be careful what you ask for, otherwise you might end up doing some, uh, some release testing um, <laughs> on a, a Sunday afternoon like Jess did on one of her projects, right? Oh, oh that was miserable, yeah. Yeah, be careful what you wish for. Um, <laughs> and, as I mean, Simon says, and it's really wise, don't be afraid to ask those questions because I have, of all the people I've ever worked with, the DevOps or release engineering people have been some of the most excited to sit down with me and talk yeah. to me about what they're doing and how things work. Yeah. And that gets the conversation going so that if you have a need in the future, you have that relationship and it already exists. You have some similar language to talk about the problems. So it really yeah. helps. So true. Um, yeah. Striking up a, a relationship with, uh, with folk in order to um, ask them the, the questions in the first place is, uh, it's probably a, a topic for a webinar in itself, um, but uh, a topic for another time, I think. We haven't um, we haven't quite managed to uh, to keep this down to the half hour that we were aiming for. Um, we are still going to take um, a few questions. I think we're going to have to keep it limited to um, three or four maximum. Um, so I've got a I've got a question here from. Um, and I'm not entirely sure how to, to say this, so I'm probably going to mangle this person's name quite severely. Vakos Harbik, I think it is, um, who's asking, do you see test charters as um, replacements for traditional tests? Jess, any thoughts? Um, I, I, I guess I'm not sure. I, how to interpret the question um, if it means if the question is asking for if I see them as a replacement for traditional test plans or sort of test planning in that sense um, I think that 
tools have been developed with different levels of usefulness in different contexts. So for my team, the test charter has pretty much taken over the place of the traditional test plan in the sense that I'm not sitting down and I am not writing out a checklist with step-by-step -step instructions because my entire team knows how to use the product. So we don't, we don't need that level of granularity. Um, in terms of the actual tests themselves, we're using the charters to conduct exploratory testing as well. So mm -hmm. the plan is written as a starting point, not as, a, as kind of the end result. Uh, we use more of the checklists and test planning in features that we are adding to the regression test checklist because yep. we always want to be able to know what we, that the things that we expect to work and that are mission critical did not break. But I see those as two separate things and I've used those in two separate ways on my team. It doesn't mean that it wouldn't work differently in a different situation. Yeah. Just a, a follow-up question as well from um, Laurie Nakamura. Um, can test rail um, serve as the test charter tool? Um, I've got to answer that one because obviously it's test rail focused. Um, and the answer is yes, you can use test rail as the, uh, the test charter tool. Um, check out the um, exploratory test type um, when you're creating your test cases in test rail. Um, and just to, just to follow up on something uh, that, that Jess was saying about the, uh, the, the information that's contained within those charters, I think um, a rule of thumb that I've tended to, to follow um, is, and I think it's from um, James Bark originally, but I may be wrong, is that um, test documentation um, gem is generally written with the, uh, the assumption that the, uh, the person carrying out the, the testing is familiar with the, uh, the um, application under test or the, the device under test to, uh, to, to some extent. Um, and that's certainly the, the way that I tend to try and approach writing my test cases, test charters, et cetera, is, is you know, write them um, as, as though they're intended to, to be used by somebody that is, you know, at least familiar with the, the stuff you're testing to some degree. Um, we've got a, another question from um, Kayla Macklin. Um, Jess, what, what do you think the, the best place is to go and learn Git? Um, and some of the uh, the other version control uh, tools that you were talking about. So there is a book, and it's totally free, and uh, it's called ProGit. Uh, so git-scm.com/book, and it's entirely free. It's Creative Commons. You can buy it, but you can also go and find it for free. And that's probably been the greatest resource I've used for actually looking up Git commands because I always, there, there are a few that I remember really, really well, but if I need to do something and I've forgotten how to do it, I can find the answer there. Um, there are tons of online courses available, so you can pay for something through uh, Udemy or Code Academy, uh, might have something available you can find free YouTube videos. It really depends on what's available to you and on the needs that you have in using the tool. Yeah. What was the, uh, the, the book that you mentioned again, Jess? Oh, Pro-Git. Pro-Git, is that? Yeah, Pro-Git. Pro-Git. So folk can, uh, can go and Google that. Um, yes. and probably they'll, they'll end up in the, the right place. The first result that I have when I Google that is the link to the free online version of the book. Okay. So I've got um, one other question, I think, from, um, again, this is from uh, Laurie Nakamura. Um, so there's a, there's a bunch of other questions as well, and we will try and answer those um, in some follow-up um, communications on the blog or something like that. 
um, but this one stood out to me. But our dev teams, I'm just reading this out word for word, our dev teams typically interact mainly via commenting on tickets in issue tracking systems and email. Do you find daily stand-up meetings useful instead or in addition to um, these methods? So the, the more collaborative methods, I guess, that you were referring to, Jess? Um, we use both. My team is 100% remote. We all live across the United States, and occasionally we have uh, some team members check, check in from um, EMEA, so, our, uh, so Europe. So we use daily stand-up. We have one common time, and in addition to our collaborative tools, because that's all we have. We don't have that shared office time together. So we find it critical. I don't know if it's so critical if you're sharing office time together. I think it really it depends on the office culture and it depends on the willingness level that your devs might have in doing a daily stand-up in addition to the other collaborative things that you're doing. I don't think that you can put these kind of collaborations into a daily stand-up because it would be a little bit long. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, um, Jess, Thank you so much um, for being a guest presenter on um, our first TestRail webinar. Um, I think we're, we're going to wrap it up at this point. Um, Chris, was there uh, another slide with some links on? Sure is. There we go. Do you want to do you, do you say a few words, Chris? No, I just uh, basically thank you to everybody for uh, joining us. I'm excited that, that we uh, we pulled this one off. It's a great show. Jess, thank you so much. Simon, thank you. Um, wonderful tips. And we're planning one of these every quarter at a minimum. So look out for another invite to everybody. Um, hoping for end of January, 1st of um, uh, February. Um, also look out for our e-books um, and go to our blog. We'd love to keep sharing our thought leadership around testing and testing tools. Thanks yeah, so much. Thanks, thanks Thank everybody for, for, for joining. Um, it's great to, to see lots of uh, familiar names on the, uh, the attendee list. Um, yeah, it's Jess, wonderful. Again, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, and thanks, everybody, for uh, being here. And please uh, forward on any questions. All right, cool. Sayonara.